it's not simply a perspective enhancer. It, it, it changes how you, your body and your brain deal with, with opiates. I think uh, Tim Ferriss has actually talked about that before yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, I, I've seen it in my practice and there are medical studies. So I don't think that we should throw out the fact that, um, you know, cannabis can, can help the opioid crisis. And then also to, you know, you want to look at it from a clinical perspective, right? So we know that opioids can kill people, right? Because it acts on the brain stem, whereas, whereas, you know, cannabis doesn't. So, you know, you might be saying, you know, you're just substituting one for the other. And, you know, sometimes that is true. But if you're using a less harmful substance, you know, to me, that's like a huge win, yes. right? So if someone, you know, has to drink, you know, 12 beers a night versus smoking like one joint, man, that's that's awesome. And I mean, you look at all, all these clinics, like you look at like methadone clinics. I mean, what are they doing? They're, they're trying to get people off one substance to, you know, a substance that um, is a little bit less harmful. Yes. And I think that when you when you use cannabis, you know, it can be effective uh, for, for opioids. It can also be effective for, for benzodiazepines and for other medicines as well. So, you know, it would be awesome if everyone would just, you know, feel happy and great all the time by just exercise and, and, and nutrition. And, you know, that's what I advocate and that's what I try to do personally. And that's what I try to, you know, say to my patients all the time. But <clears throat> I understand, though, that, you know, sometimes life is hard. Sometimes, you know, th things hit you. You know, you have you have crisis in your life. You have, you know, personal crisis that can, you know, throw off your mental health. And then you have, you get into a car accident, you know, and it, you could be in really severe pain. And, and in those times, you know, sometimes diet, exercise, meditation, doing all the right things just isn't quite enough. And, you know, I think that it's great that we have cannabis for those situations because it does seem to be, you know, very effective and has less side effects compared to some of the other medicines, <clears throat> compared to some of the other medicines that we have traditionally used. Um, and, you know, even though, you know, I'm talking about opiates and, and deaths, you know, we can also talk about NSAIDs, right? Like non-steroidal yeah. anti-inflammatory drugs. So, you know, th these drugs can also, you know, wreak havoc on your GI system. Um, I saw one study, actually, I tweeted out, uh, uh, Rhonda Patrick tweeted out, said that if you use uh, NSAIDs, it was really short. I got to look it up again, but it was like two weeks. It can decrease your uh, your gonadotropins, which can stimulate your, your testosterone level by like 25%. And on that note, too, we should talk about, I've, I can't believe I forgot to talk about this, but opioids can drastically um, inhibit your uh, your uh, testosterone production, right? Which is a huge thing for depression. Because I've had guys come in to me before um, that have been, uh, you know, really, really depressed. You just give them a small amount of testosterone and man, they're off their antidepressants and they're off to the races. They're, they're doing great. So, <clears throat> you know, are we creating a lot of people who are, who are depressed because they're using opiates and their testosterone levels are low? And, you know, for men, I mean, having low testosterone is horrible. Horrible. You know, your libido goes, you know, you're going to have low motivation. Um, you know, you're not going to feel as well. You're not going to want to do things. So, you know, um, if you're giving someone a medicine that, that, that nails their, their testosterone levels down, that's going to really, you know, wreck, 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 wreck havoc on their mental health. And I just want to make a note too. Because Ben Greenfield, who, again, I really, really respect. I like that guy a lot. Um, you know, was talking a little bit with you about testosterone and um, and, uh, and, and and cannabis and how it can drop it. So I think there was three studies I saw done on, on humans. Um, and two of them uh, noted no statistical difference in, in, in drop in testosterone levels. And one study, the other study noted uh, a small statistical difference. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, it may drop your testosterone levels a little bit, but it's not going to, you know, substantially um, drop them. So just so people, people know, know that, because I know that comes up um, all the time, you know? Oh, uh, yes. As the, as the, as the dumb anti-drug advocates like to say, doobies cause boobies. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. The, yeah. That, that is, that is, that is not, right. that is right. not right. It is, there's it no going, there's no, there's no, yeah, no, no, I know, I know. I'm, yeah. no, yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. Right. Um, Risperdal causes boobies, <laughs> but that's a different issue. Um, Risperdal is an antipsychotic. Risperdal, mm, yeah. Well, yeah. So, so look, I think, I think the issue of whether cannabis is a gateway drug, I, I, there, it's a hundred percent clear that cannabis is a gateway drug. The argument is why. Did you say it's a hundred percent clear? hundred percent clear. The argument is why. Okay, so there, okay. so it's quite clear that cannabis use 
oftentimes precedes other drug use, whether it's opioids, cocaine, other drugs. Now, one argument, and this is actually a pro-legalization argument, is one reason it's a gateway is that if it's illegal, you got to buy it from your friendly neighborhood dealer. He might have access to heroin or cocaine, other drugs. And so eventually, maybe you decide to try one of those other drugs. So actually, that's really why the Dutch legalized. They wanted to create an avenue for people to use cannabis that wasn't connected to other drugs. Okay. Another possibility is that using an addictive intoxicating substance, you, you might like it and you might want to try other addictive intoxicating substances and it might prime your brain. And then the third possibility really is that there are just some people who are risk takers out there, right? They use, they're going to use cannabis, they're going to gamble, they're going to, and cannabis is a little bit easier to access than other drugs. So they're probably going to try cannabis first. So it's not really that, that cannabis drives the use. It's just that cannabis is first. They're just now, curious people. The, but what's but, your thoughts on, so, on? Well, what I will say, I mean, I'm just going to go back to the NAM report, right? I mean, I mean, you quote these people yes. in, in your book. Um, you know, so this committee couldn't find sufficient data demonstrating an association between cannabis use and initiating opioid use. They found no compelling evidence to support the gateway drug theory. So, so again, but that's, the, the gateway, those are the people that you quote in your right. book. So there's been more research done since then. How, and, but but what things I, have radically changed? I, I would say things have changed some. Here's, here's, here's what I would rather say. I think that probably it's a combination of these <clears throat> things, right? It's, there's certainly an environmental factor where, again, if you're buying from somebody who's got an, access to other illegal drugs, maybe you try those drugs. At the same time, getting high feels good, and maybe you want to try other drugs. And at the same <clears throat> time, you're just a risk taker. Okay. What is what nobody seriously ever said until about the last five years is that cannabis could be an off ramp for opioids. Okay, and there's a lot of reasons to believe that's a really bad idea. First of all, cannabis, if you actually need opioids for pain relief, cannabis is not a good enough pain reliever. It's like alcohol, it's a mild pain reliever, it's not strong enough. If you're dying from cancer, cannabis probably is not the pain reliever that you need. You need opioids. Okay, and the, again, the state level data is not as good. If you want to really figure out what's happening to an individual, the best way to do that is to follow that individual. And there's a really good paper that came out in 2017 after the NAM report, so they didn't have it, that shows that people who used cannabis in 2001, this is based on a large national study in the US, were three times as likely to be using opioids three years later. Okay, and that just intuitively makes sense to me. And the other thing that people on the legalization side don't ever talk about is who are the two countries that have the most cannabis use in the West, the U.S. and Canada? Where are the two, who are the two countries that have by far the worst opioid epidemic, the U.S. and Canada? Okay, but there's a real issue with that because the United States is also the only country other than New Zealand that allows pharmaceutical companies to, to advertise. advertise. Sure. I mean, there's a there's yes, a, but, the, the but Canada of, doesn't. The amount of opiates that are prescribed in the United States is fucking preposterous. I and agree. Particularly the if you, I don't know if you ever saw the documentary, the OxyContin Express, but the way Florida used to be structured, yep. where they didn't have a database. Yep. And, and, and you, you could just literally go from yes. pharmacy to pharmacy. Yeah. 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 No, uh, we have a problem with the way we prescribe drugs in this country. Opioids, ADD drugs, benzos, right. SSRIs, all and of them. And we're connected to cannabis, and so it, it makes sense that it would filter over there. Yes, but what I would say is the people who think that cannabis is not part of that over-prescribing problem are deluding themselves. And what do you think to that? So can you repeat the question again? Uh, so, so, so I I agree with Joe. The, the way the, the, the access to opioids in the U.S. I mean, certainly it's come down a little bit in the last couple of years. But you know, mm -hmm. Purdue Pharma, there's a special place in hell for those guys. But not it's not just opioids. We prescribe too many benzos. We prescribe too many ADD drugs. We probably prescribe too many SSRIs. We prescribe too much in this I think country. We, I think we all I agree. agree on and, that. I, and, I, and, I agree and, with and that. And I think that cannabis is another example of us looking for a drug to solve our problems. But what, what I'm, okay, again, just from a clinical perspective, um, you know, I can't just rely on, on diet and exercise for all my patients. I have to use other tools. Sure. And again, like everyone here in this room, like we're all pretty healthy. I don't have, you know, a bad back or, you know, I don't have a mental health diagnosis or anything going on. So, you know, I, I have to look at patients that, that are coming to me, right? So the way I see it is that, you know, we just mentioned a, a bunch of other drugs, you know, antidepressants, amphetamines, all these types of things, you know, cannabis. And again, you know, I'm going to separate the THC and the CBD. It's an incredible 
medicine and it doesn't kill people, right? So as a clinician, you know, that, that's so comforting for me to know that every single night I go to bed, I killed zero people. I know that, right? So that's really, really comforting f- for me to know. Also, I feel, you know, we we're just talking about amphetamines and we were just talking about, you know, SSRIs. I feel that cannabis, you know, particularly the CBD component can actually be more effective. You know, that's what I've seen a lot in my practice and other people have seen that as well. So, you know, I think that we need to we need to take that in, into consideration when we're using all these drugs. And, and Alex, you know, some of the things that you're saying, you know, <clears throat> they're quite, you know, um, admirable and, and in a lot of things like researchers say, you know, are, are quite admirable as well. And, and, you know, they, they feel that they can, you know, tell clinicians, um, you know, give them really good advice, but they're not the ones in the trenches. They're not the ones in front of the people. They're not the ones that, that have to have to chat with patients. You know, I have an obligation to do something for my patients to make them better. I really feel, you know, we just listed a bunch of drugs that cannabis is uh, a really, really effective tool and, and it doesn't kill anybody. So, you know, because of that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to keep, keep using it. But like I said, I'm always looking for other drugs. I'm always looking for other, you know, alternatives to, to also um, help my patients. But I think that, you know, using cannabis is, is, is a really effective tool for a lot of clinicians and it's helped a lot of patients. But what do you think about his argument about it being a gateway drug? Other than what these people said in the study that there's no evidence that supports that it's a gateway drug, what are your personal feelings about that argument? So I, I don't feel that uh, that cannabis is a gateway drug. I do feel that, you know, one of the uh, the things that you mentioned earlier is that, you know, some people kind of have this personality where they're like an Risk experiment, yeah, yeah. right? And they, they just, they just want to want to try something so you know the fact is that alcohol and cannabis just get introduced first right. most of the time right. most people you know don't do you know coke or, or lsd and then hey say hey man let, let's try some some cannabis right? right so it's just that that's the very first one there so if we so you could say anything that, that that was easier access. If there was some new drug that you know did something similar to alcohol or similar to cannabis and that was introduced in, in our society, you'd be calling that the gateway drug. Well, um, and I do feel, and I I, I do uh, believe well, that. Alcohol has clearly na- been demonstrated as being the gateway drug to almost all heart and, drugs yes. because of the, the loosening of inhibitions. Whereas the opposite could be said about cannabis that it makes you paranoid. You might actually be <laughs> less likely to try cocaine afterwards. And and I know that the name, uh, you know, they don't they don't feel that the cannabis is a gateway drug either i mean again they said you know they found no compelling evidence to support the gateway theory and again i mean these are the people that you are quoting in in your book alex right let let me just go a little bit further they said in a retrospective cohort study um may it from etal and the 2016 examined the transition from cannabis use to the use of other illicit drugs they found that the probability of initiating other illicit drugs after cannabis did not differ significantly from the probability of, st- of starting with other illicit drugs. So it's just that cannabis is there first. It's definitely not a gateway drug in any stretch of the imagination. Uh, again, I, I, dis- I totally disagree. And there, again, there's 50 years of data on this. Uh, I know the studies that he's quoting, but there are, there are many others. And I think the argument is as to why. And again, I think the argument that, that to some extent, having access to this drug via, you know, illegally tends to open you up to other illegal stuff, which to me is an argument for legalization. So, but I I do want to throw one thing out there. You know, I don't know how many of your viewers have teenage kids or, you know, it's it's, probably more likely to be teenage kids than to have teenage kids. But, you know, the book has, (laughs) the one thing that really worries me in the, if we're talking about gateway drugs is that Juul and vaping are really a gateway to THC vaping. So you can, you know, you can. Why do you say that? Because, well, first of all, it gets people, it gets kids, teenagers used to inhaling, you know, this illicit substance. And you can actually retrofit a jewel pod with THC. They don't sell them, but you can, you know, you can easily go online and look up how to do it. And I think it really worries me. And I've heard from a lot of parents in the last month that there is an epidemic of nicotine vaping and THC vaping going on right now. And that... I think, and, and we're talking about 15, 16, 17-year-olds inhaling pure THC, the most dangerous form of this drug. And I think, unfortunately, it's not going to take long before the mental health consequences of that become apparent. And 
And I really do hope that the book gives parents some tools to talk to their kids about that, if, if nothing else.